seminar uh, with Sally Uren, who is the head of Forum for the Future. Uh, I am Jeffrey Hollander, the co-founder and CEO of ASBC. And if you're not familiar with ASBC, check out our website. We are a business membership organization. And if you're not already a member, we'd love to have you consider joining us. Today, uh, we're going to hear from Sally, who's going to talk about developing sustainable systems-based business strategies for this crazy post-COVID world that we live in. And I've known Sally for many, many years and am a huge admirer of the work that she and Forum for the Future do. I had the honor of serving on their advisory board for several years. And they are an unusual organization because they think about the future in a way that few consulting firms do. And their systems-based approach generates amazing and, and fascinating and very important business insights. Um, they're also an unusual consulting firm because they're a nonprofit consulting firm. And as a result, they are there to work completely for their clients' benefits as opposed to generating profits for their firm. And I find that unique and very admirable. So I'll let Sally get started. We will have ample opportunity for questions and answers. And uh, I will be monitoring the chat throughout. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And I will ask Sally as many of the questions as I can when she is done with her presentation. So Sally, we're lucky to have you and look forward to what you have to say. Uh, Dr. Sally Uren, take it away. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Thank you for the kind introduction. And this is indeed the description of Forum for the Future. So Jeffrey is totally right. We are a nonprofit. Uh, we have a mission to accelerate progress towards sustainable development. And we do that by trying to catalyze progress towards critical global challenges. And yes, Jeffrey was actually um, involved at the very beginning of Forum's existence in the US and really helped us um, think about our strategy. We also have an office in London and then in Singapore and Mumbai. And we've been working now for over two decades in partnership with business, with government, with civil society, to really try and use our futures tools and our systems expertise to really catalyze change towards sustainable development. So what I'd like to cover today are three things really. Um, I want to share with you some emerging research that we're undertaking right now, which is trying to make sense of both our crazy COVID world, but where we might be headed next. And then to touch upon why, when it comes to responding to this uncertainty, this complexity that we're seeing in front of us, that systems change offers as a way of making sense and responding to this complexity. And then I'll just finish up with some thoughts as to how businesses might develop strategies which are based around the desire to create systemic change and touch on why this is an evolution of how we um, generally tend to think about a sustainability strategy and then we can have a Q&A. So that's the plan. Um, so starting first with our changing world, Jeffrey will know that each year we undertake a scan of the interesting trends, the weak signals that we see in the world around us. And we've published something called the future of sustainability. And to your left are the last two years publications. And this is a really important tool for us because it helps raise awareness of where the world might be going. Um, we take on board a wide range of opinions. And the reason why it's really important is that Forum, we don't believe the future is just something that happens to you. Um, we very much su subscribe to the quote by William Gibson, which is, the future is already here, it's all around us, it's just not evenly distributed. And so if we can understand these flashes of the future today, then we can harness the change around us, grab hold of those, those future insights and actually begin to create the future that we want. Um, and never has that been more important and more of that in a moment. So at the beginning of this year, we were getting ready to publish this year's Future of Sustainability. 
we'd already decided to shift from looking at trends to looking at dynamic areas and we were due to publish in May but of course that didn't happen and what we have done is actually dug a lot deeper into the insights and we shared the first cut of our insights actually Jeffrey was there at a dinner in New York, which I don't know about you, Jeffrey, but that's the last time I was allowed out and had a dinner with anyone other than my family. So um, it will really remain with me. But we shared the insights and we began the conversation back in March in New York. How might COVID really alter the dynamics of the next decade? And I'm going to share some thoughts as to how we think that might play forward. So COVID-19 then um, was just really gaining traction in the US when I was last there at the um, end of March and really is the first shock of the decade. So in last year's Future Sustainability Report, um, we called it um, looking at systems change in turbulent times. And we already were very clear that the 2020s not only were this decade of delivery, a critical decade to make really bold choices when it comes to sustainability but was also going to be incredibly turbulent um, but I don't think even as a forum that spends a lot of our time looking at the future I don't think we would have predicted COVID-19 happening quite so soon at the beginning of the decade and the profound nature of the shock that it's given to our economic system our social system the environment and it is really one of those unpredictable big impact events um, having an impact on almost everything. So COVID-19 has been affecting flows of information, how goods and services reach the markets, it's affected supply chains, whole supply chains have pivoted from manufacturing in the case of Burberry, one of our partners, trench coats into um, personal public, um, personal pr protective equipment. It's affected our relationships, societal structures. Um, COVID has had a profound impact on how governments are operating, really impacting this thing called the Overton window, the kind of set of reasonable policies that we see. That's all really changed over the last three to four months. And obviously it's affected us all at a really, really personal level. We, I'm sure I do, all know people that have been affected profoundly by this virus. And one of the ways that we can begin to understand that change is by using the analogy of an iceberg as a way of really underlying that COVID-19 is probably one of the biggest shocks we've seen to the system for a very, very long time because it has impacted absolutely everything. Um, so not just the kind of the surface level events, but actually the undercurrents, the, the mindsets that influence how we run our economy, how we live our, our lives. And on the, on the one hand, this has been really difficult to live through, really disruptive. Um, and my goodness, we're set to see much more disruption to come in as we go forward. But because this has been a major moment of dislocation, a major moment of discontinuity, actually the ability to then use this period of change to create something perhaps better than that that we had as we went into this crisis, that opportunity is really there because so much profound change is happening at all of these levels. And Christina uh, Figueres um, gave this quote um, just a, a couple of weeks ago, and I would really agree in that because absolutely everything has shifted around us, what we do next over the six, next six, six to 18 months is completely critical because we're seeing trillions of dollars being spent on economic recovery, how those dollars are configured, the degree to which they put conditions on decarbonization, conditions on environmental restoration has never been more important. And I think one of the insights that has really occurred to me over the last few weeks is that we talked about the decade of delivery. We knew that the next 10 years was really critical for dealing with the climate emergency. Actually, I don't even think it's a decade. I think what happens over the next six to 18 months will determine whether or not we're able to deal successfully. Not that it, I don't think there's going to be success, but meaningfully and in a way that sets us on a reasonable trajectory. So it's not the next decade of delivery, it's actually the next six to 18 months, which I think is really super critical. 
So turning back then to our analysis of what we thought might be um, really describing the next decade um, before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we'd identified what we'd call, uh, what we're calling dynamic areas. So these are clusters of trends, clusters of weak signals that are incredibly dynamic and have the potential for a really profound impact on our operating context. And I'm just going to describe the four that we were already working on ahead of this crisis and just reflect on how COVID has really impacted on those four areas. So the first area then, um, biosphere tipping points. Um, this is not a new dynamic area. We've known for a few years now that actually tipping points can become cascades. And we know that if, for example, that Amazon reaches deforestation levels of more than 20%, then we'll get a tip into savannah. That then might tip the boreal forest, which then will tip the Arctic ice sheets. And we know, we've known that this is a real possibility. That hasn't gone away in the light of COVID. But what I think has been really interesting as a result of the last three to four months is that COVID has shone a really stark light on the fact that planetary health equals human health equals economic health. And so these tipping points are still moving ahead. COVID hasn't impacted them directly, but what it's done has told us that actually we are inextricably linked to these biosphere tipping points and that what happened in a wet market in Wuhan has paralyzed the entire global economy and has had a devastating impact on human life. The second dynamic area was the interplay of a number of energy and finance trends. So before COVID hit, uh, a lot of commentators were already saying that the chances of a global recession were high. And we're already seeing the prospect of stranded assets as we saw a rapid move to renewables. Um, and so the impact of COVID means that the economic crisis is no longer theoretical, it's incredibly real. Um, and that bailouts, um, as Christina Figueres has noted, they actually could lock in this unsustainable system or enable the emergence of a new one. And what I think we have seen over the last few months is a rapid acceleration to renewables. And the next three to six months will be telling, can we sustain that? The third dynamic area is what we're calling um, the political tech nexus. So this is an amalgamation of um, political trends and also trends within tech. So centralizing power dynamics where we know that um, we've got much more AI in the system and that um, online we're getting greater fragmentation. It's not just fake news, it's activism online. Um, but we're also seeing online that we're able to organize. Um, and I think what has really been interesting within the, this COVID crisis is that it's impacted both real life communities, but online communities. Um, and this is the, a, an amalgamation of trends, which I think could go in a number of different directions over the next six to 12 months. Um, we've certainly seen over the last few weeks that public data, sorry, public health outcomes have been put above privacy concerns, um, which, you know, is reasonable, um, but where is the accountability in that system? Then the fourth dynamic area and the one that I think offers us more hope than the other three is this emerging regenerative narrative. The fact that um, as we have seen COVID play through, the need for a fundamentally different approach is clear. And before code, we were already noticing scaling of regenerative agricultural practices in the US, but elsewhere in the world. We were seeing, seeing the emergence of, of new business models, ones that were working both for social equity and environmental, um, environmental positivity, not just based on short-term profit maximization. And what we're seeing right now is a really vibrant conversation about what is the purpose of the economy? Is it just feeding that finance machine or is it much more broader than that? Um, so this is a really busy chart, um, but it's a way of describing these four dynamic areas according to a tool that we use a lot at Forum called the multi-level perspective. And this is a way of describing what a system might look like. And 
it really speaks to the fact that any system, be it the global economic system, um, be it the education system, uh, be it an ecosystem, tends to operate at three levels. So at the landscape level of a system, that's where we have the big, slow moving trends playing through. And this is where we've got those biosphere feedbacks and tipping points. These are slow moving, um, but profound in the nature of their impact on the regime, which is where we all live our lives. It's where um, trends such as changes in legislation will play through. And that's where we see the dynamic areas of energy and finance and democracy governance and tech play through, influencing our day-to-day -day lives. And then any system has a niche where there are things bubbling away, they may or may not come to hit the mainstream, or, and, or they may completely come into the mainstream and transform the mainstream. And that's where we're seeing this emerging regenerative paradigm playing through. And the, the, the orange colors are where we're seeing actually COVID has really accelerated change in this space. Um, and then we've got these hexa hex hexagonal, um, actually they're not hex, they're pens, anyway, they want to, six sides, I think that's hexagonal. Um, but the one I wanted to draw your attention to is this generational values transition at the bottom. Because not only have we got these four dynamic areas, ahead of COVID, we'd already identified a number of what we were calling mid-decade tipping points. And one of them was the fact that we are seeing a generational transition. We're seeing a generation coming through for whom ownership is less important than the previous generation and for whom who they work for really, really matters. And actually what we're seeing through COVID is those mid-decade tipping points, so generational transition, irreversible tip from fossils to renewables, actually that's happening now. It's beginning to ha happen right now. So what we thought might be really pivotal moments mid-decade are actually playing through at this point in time. So there are the four dynamic areas influencing the landscape, the regime, the niche. But what does that really mean? What is going to happen? And of course, we don't know the answer to that question. Um, predicting the future is totally a fool's game, um, pretty much impossible to do. But what we can do is begin to understand the different trajectories that are emerging out of this crisis. And we've been doing an awful lot of work over the last few weeks looking at, well, what actually is happening with those system shifters? And we've identified four trajectories. Um, the first, in no particular order, is unknown. This is a continuation of where we are at the moment. It may pan, pan, pan through, it may not. But what we're definitely seeing right now is the emergence of three other trajectories. And going back to where I started, this means that what we do over the next year has never been more important because we are seeing collapse already. We're seeing a trajectory emerge where there isn't enough to share and we must protect our own. We are seeing the rise of nationalism. We're seeing the, the failing of multilateralism in some quarters. We're also seeing disciplined tech enabled control is there to keep us safe. This is um, also a trajectory in which we see that the, the growth model that we have today um, is very narrow in its articulation. But we're also seeing transform. We're seeing that awareness that planetary health can equal human health, can equal economic health, and that the fates are deeply, deeply intertwined. We're seeing that recognition lead to City, City of Amsterdam adopting the donor economics model, for example. We're seeing new business models emerge. We're seeing businesses making really bold commitments. So Unilever's Nature and Climate Fund, um, they're not alone. We're seeing lots of attention on nature-based solutions. So the fact is that all of the, these three trajectories, you can see signals of all of these happening right now. Um, and this is where the importance of mindset becomes really, really critical. So in the unknown, which is a continuation of where we are right now, we need a mindset of resilience. Um, and this is where we see mixed powers, power and organization will just continue to, they'll have to sort of adapt continually to this change. Moving to discipline, then this is a sort of more managerial mindset. Um, this is where power is distributed between powerful centralized nodes. And this is a very top down world. And then moving to the far, far right collapse this is 
reductionist control mindset, it's very fractures. Organizations are working as machines of production and profit. Whereas in Transform, we have a regenerative mindset. We have a mindset that says, you know what? The economy can work for nature. The economy can work for society. Power is distributed between civil society, the third sector, public sector, business, philanthropy, and organizations understand that actually they need to be adaptive. They need to understand the complexity in the world around them to allow the emergence of something that was better than we had. Which is why I would argue that right now in this COVID world that's emerging into a post-COVID world, depending on where you are in, in, in the geographies around us, systems change offers us a way of making sense of this complexity and it offers us a way of really focusing on that transform trajectory. And Don Ella Meadows was one of the first practitioners in systems change. Systems change isn't, isn't particularly new, but the application of systems change to sustainable development challenges really is something that offers us a way of driving catalytic change. And so really famous quote from Don Ella Meadows, um, our world is complex, it's interconnected, but we treat it as though it isn't. And then we wonder why we're not able to solve for global problems. COVID has shone a light on the degree of that complexity. And so the sooner we are able to respond to the world around us right now using a systems lens, then the better I think we will be. What is a system? It's simply a configuration of parts. And this is a picture of a heather beetle. Um, if we have time later, I'll tell you why I picked a picture of a heather beetle. It's to do with my PhD, which was looking at natural systems. But what's critical about a system is that the emphasis is from the individual parts to how they connect. And that allows us then to understand how to drive systemic change. And the good news is that our society, our structures, the way we operate, it's just a record of the past decisions that we made. And that we know this now, we've lived through it over the last three to four months. Everything is continually adapting and changing. And so right now in this post-COVID landscape or mid-COVID landscape, actually harnessing the fact that everything is literally changing, going back to the iceberg, deep, deep mindset shift is changing, deep structural shifts are happening around us, then we can harness this dynamism and create new outcomes, new goals, and create the emergence of new systems. And the big shift that we need to make if we think about driving systemic change is that actually we need to be really designing for transformational change. So as we are thinking about designing sustainability strategies in this COVID landscape, then we need to be designing for transformational strategies. So strategies that are driving self-sustaining change, we often don't pay enough attention to that. We come up with innovations, but we haven't thought enough about well, what needs to be true in the system around that innovation to drive that change and then catalytic change so how can we design a new business model that then allows greater access to finance for smallholders that then allows them to provide access to education for their family that's an example of catalytic change so the last section so as an organization then how do we design these strategies that allow us to navigate this COVID complexity and allow us to harness the best of systems thinking and drive the emergence of new resilient systems. A couple of things. Um, organizations really need to understand the world around them as a set of interconnected systems and use that understanding to understand, identify where they can make the biggest difference. So a pharma company really needs to pay attention to climate. Um, simply by bringing down their direct carbon emissions, they're going to improve health outcomes for the populations around them. But also by really looking at diseases such as malaria and solving for those, then we have climate and health impacts. Climate change, elevated temperatures is increasing the, uh, the, the occurrence of malaria, which obviously has got known health impacts. And so as a pharma company, how can you really shine a light on that climate health intersection and make interventions that drive climate and health benefits simultaneously? Similarly, in the food system, how can you focus on soil quality in a way that then drives nutritional outcomes in crops, which then improves um, health and well-being of individuals? 
So as an organization, where do these systems interconnect and allow you to really intervene to drive multiple benefits? Similarly, going back to soil, we know that if we improve soil quality, then we improve its ability to act as a carbon sink, also improves nutrition, also has health outcomes. So really understanding these interconnections to drive that transformational change. And it will require business to move way beyond their direct sphere of control and not even going into the sphere of influence. We need to go into the sphere of concern. And I think what is really interesting right now in this kind of COVID landscape is that actually now is the moment for businesses to find their voice because we know that there are deep structural inequalities in the, in the world around us. We know that we need structural reform of society. We need structural reform of the economy. Business has got a real important role to play in advocacy, which means moving from your sphere of control into your sphere of influence and sphere of concern. So how might business right now advocate for that structural change that we know is needed in society and in the economy? And I would say that a strategy for system change is different from traditional strategy in the following ways. Um, a classic strategy is all about maintaining a status quo ordinarily, but a system change strategy brings it outside in, allows you to drive big shifts and transformations. I've talked about the difference between incremental and transformational strategy. And you know, in the past, I've certainly been involved in developing strategies which are pretty linear, pretty mechanistic. But actually, we need strategies that allow us to navigate this complexity, make swift and meaningful pivots. And adaptive strategy is how we can then move in the light of this rapid change and uncertainty and build resilience. Um, building our adaptive capacity will build resilience in our systems. So just a couple more from me. Um, if I were to summarize some of the big shifts that I think business needs to make, moving from in your sustainability strategies looking at one issue at a time to understanding the whole system short-term incremental solutions their day is done we need to look at a set of interventions which harness this massive dislocation that we're facing right now and drive the emergence of new systems we've known for a while we can't solve this on our own covid has shone a, shone a light on the fact that actually things really move when you've got the public sector collaborating with the private sector Linear plans in our COVID world don't make any sense whatsoever. And the really hard bit, the last three months have shown us that we can't guarantee certainty and order. And this will remain true for the rest of this decade. And so what is that learning approach that shapes our experiments? We have a hypothesis of how we might create change. How do we learn and then make a pivot? And these are two questions that I've been asking myself in all the work I do over the last few years, and I think are really relevant for this COVID context. In designing a sustainability strategy, ask ourselves, am I just locking in this existing unsustainable system? So am I just gonna allow this current economic construct to continue? Or am I designing for a new system, something that will be better? And that fundamentally means articulating a different set of goals for a system. So for the economic system, the economic system, if it's going to shift to be much more alongside this regenerative thinking, needs to be a system that's designed for environmental and social value. Then I think we can deliver the sustainable development goals. And then in everything we do, are we designing for transformational change as opposed to incremental change? So I would urge you all to keep asking yourself these questions. And the, the final word in that word, and I'll stop sharing. Um, the more attention we pay to the transform trajectory, the more likely it is to emerge. Self-fulfilling and self-defeating prophecies are real. So if we want that transform trajectory to emerge, then I think actually we can make it happen. I'll stop there and hand back to Jeffrey. Thank you so much, Sally. Wow, that was uh, intense and uh, a tremendous amount to uh, digest here. A uh, number of questions have emerged as you were talking, and uh, I'll pass a few of them on to you. Uh, first one, businesses 
are often by design incrementally focused and they're nervous about transformational change. What can you do to sort of change the culture of a company or what do you need to change at a company to prepare it to think and, and act in a more transformational fashion? Yeah, um, great question. I think the first step to trigger designing a shift from designing from incremental to transformational change is to have a longer term goal in mind and um, have that sense of as a business, what is my contribution to society and the environment and the economy? And to have that sort of longer term guiding star, because if you know as a business what that really meaningful contribution to sustainable development looks like, then you can start to deploy a range of tactics. So for sure, you can't pivot immediately from a set of incremental change strategies to transformational ones. Um, but what you can do is experiment much more deliberately if you know where you want to get to. So I think the big pivot for me is that businesses, um, and this is happening already, need to shift from asking, okay, so what am I here to do? And it isn't just about short-term profit maximization. It's much broader than that. And I think the rise in interest around stakeholder capitalism is a really useful construct because actually the, the longer term license to operate will be delivered by understanding how can I turn a profit, but in, in a way that actually builds environmental value, in a way that builds societal value. Because if I can't build environmental value, then, you know, nature is often said that nature, if nature was a bank, it would have been bailed out a long time ago. Well, it's true. We're going to run out of natural assets. And right now as well, if I'm not able to operate my business in a way that I'm building social capital, then I'm not going to attract the best talent. I'm not going to be able to build community resilience. And so the fundamental premise is that long term economic success and even short and medium term economic success is linked with your ability to deal with these big sustainable development issues. So having that articulation of what is my contribution to sustainability gives you a null star that then you can start to experiment towards. And you'll have a number of bets in play. You'll have some big bets, one or two, and then you'll have the incremental stuff because you have to keep the wheels on. So you also need to be pragmatic. Great, thank you. Another question, and please remember if you have questions for Sally to send them in. Uh, another question is, you know, we're already facing mass extinctions and we have put nature at jeopardy what, uh, how do we think about that? What do we, what do, we do about this, this, this incredible disaster that is unfolding alongside COVID? Yeah, um, I think we have to understand how do we accelerate our response to restoring resilience in nature and for me in particular, that is why I'm really interested in this whole clutch of nature-based solutions. I think that offers us a real opportunity to build resilience in our energy and food systems in particular, but also do that in the way that we start to restore nature. And nature-based solutions, I wrote about this in a blog a couple of weeks ago, they're not new. Um, and the link between um, climate and biodiversity isn't new. But I think what's really emerging as we're sort of coming through this crisis, coming from planetary health equals human health equals economic health, is that actually we can use the markets to some degree to start to restore nature. And that will give us an accelerated pathway to building resilience into nature. So I think that's really quite exciting. Um, and it goes back to another thing which I think is really important for every dollar you invest as a business, how can you maximize that investment, not just for the financial health of your business, but for nature's health as well. And I would love to see more of these big funds that have been announced over the last few weeks, because honestly, they show us how interconnected nature is to economic prosperity, but they give us a turbo charge to, go into some of these really vulnerable ecosystems and begin to restore them. And um, 
I've, I am an ecologist by training and I know you can do this. And that is the hope I think we need to hold on to. We can restore systems. Okay. Well, that's hopeful. Um, another question, uh, which I'll read, how would you evaluate, prioritize and price externalities into the interconnected systems model? Yeah. And how do we align those externalities with our financial markets? I think that's a brilliant question because this is so dynamic at the moment. So going back to that transform trajectory that I talked about, um, that is a trajectory that is one where we have priced in the externalities. And it's where the work of the Capitals Coalition, um, a lot of great work that's been happening by many organizations has begun to find its way into mainstream economic accounting. And we're seeing that happen. We're seeing investors beginning to ask big businesses, so hang on a minute, what is your value at risk from climate, value at risk from biodiversity? And I actually think we're at a bit of a tipping point here because I think even before COVID, the investment community was beginning to wake up to this notion of stranded assets, um, this notion of actually a pure economic value number doesn't give you an account of the value of nature or society and so what we're seeing are instruments like nature-based solutions um, like finance bonds coming in which have actually got those externalities already begun to be incorporated within them and i think particularly one of the other reasons why we might be at this tipping point is renewables are now uh, cheaper than fossil fuels and so that in in effect has already priced in that externality because renewables don't cause any damage to nature and therefore are free to nature. So as any organization thinks about this, understanding those externalities, understanding that the sooner you price them in either directly or indirectly or quantitatively or qualitatively, the sooner you will have a strategy that enables you to drive that transform trajectory. And that transform trajectory is the best outcome we can hope for, for business, for environment and for society. And the other two collapse discipline, I don't think we're going to deliver the SDGs within those. Um, so understanding your externalities, bringing them into your decision making, placing a bet on the market that the market will soon price them in, I think will be a wise thing to do because I think they will. Great. Thank you. So this whole concept of regenerative and regeneration has become somewhat of a buzzword and it's often discussed in the concept in the con in the un focused on agriculture yes do we see regenerative business in places other than in the world of agriculture good question um yes we do um if you think about the apparel industry, for example, um, and I suppose it is linked to agriculture, but if we think about the apparel industry, and we've just actually uh, launched a project in this space on the really um, trips off your tongue, man-made cellulosics fibers. So this is viscose and rayon. Um, and these are fibers that are man-made, but actually the way in which we bring those fibers to market allows us to regenerate ecosystems. So yes, it's got an agricultural bent to it, but it's actually an application of regenerative agriculture into the apparel industry. And scaling man-made cellulose, its fibers, is a way of accelerating rest restoration, particularly of primary and endangered forests. Um, and so I think what you're seeing are models emerging outside of the ag sector where the principles of circularity just being pushed one step further so circular economy is great but in of its own right doesn't guarantee you regeneration because it's just flows moving through and i think what you're seeing now are the emergence of kind of circular economy plus models coming through which actually allow replenishment and restoration so yes you see it most in ag and i think for me the question is what can we learn from regenerative agricultural practices in terms of application to other sectors? And apparel is beginning to do that. And I think other sectors, personal and beauty care, is also beginning to do that because it sources these fibers. I think that we can learn a lot from what we've been doing in the regen ag space um, 
in the US and other countries and begin to apply that to other sectors and it's just beginning to happen. Great. So more challenging questions for you. Good. Uh, in parts of the world that have in some respects taken democracy for granted, democracy is at risk. And specifically for businesses, what can businesses do? How do businesses deal with this threat to democracy that is uh, quite scary? Yeah, it is really scary. And if we think about that collapse trajectory, that is a trajectory where there isn't really democracy as we know it today. Um, and we can see signs of that happening right now. I think I go back to the advocacy point. Um, I think businesses have enormous potential to use their advocacy and their voice to influence public policy. And we, we've known for a long time that the voice of business has often been a bit disconnected and we've known that the lobbying into Capitol Hill has been often at odds with the glossy sustainability commitments that are coming through. And I would say as a business, really understand how can you use your voice to have a conversation with governments about those joint interest areas where you can think creatively about the public policy framework and work with governments in partnership. Um, but it comes from aligning that policy voice and, uh, and stopping that practice of you know, lobbying for something that actually is at odds with your sustainability policy. Um, I'm pretty sure that still happens and that needs to stop. Um, and it's not just you know, in the US and in Europe, it happens around the world. It goes back to something that I think we don't perhaps reflect on enough and really matters right now. And it really matters for business is how do I use my power and influence to create the fabric that I want to see? And so, yes, there are parts of the world where democracy is caving in on itself, but the businesses are operating in those areas. So how do you use your voice for good and be courageous in doing that? Great. The questions are pouring in. You're stimulating more and more thought here. And someone asked a very, a very practical, basic question that they'd love your feedback on. And the question is, is renewable the same as recyclable? Oh, that's a great question. Um, not quite. Um, something that is recyclable, yes, you can continue to use it, but there might be a finite, finite number of times you can reuse it. So we know with some of these recyclable plastic solutions, we can only reuse them a number of times and they lose our integrity. Um, renewable is much more in that regenerative frame. You can just keep on replenishing. And so recyclability is useful, but probably not enough. We need renewable and regenerative solutions. Great, thank you, thank you. Someone commented that uh, Danella Meadows' book is almost 50 years old at this point and certainly took too long to affect the important thinking that it brought forward. Uh, if, if, if you could identify one priority for all the businesses that are listening to you, that they make sure they take away, what would that be? Um, I guess I, I've got a reflection. I think one of the reasons why Donella's work took so long to hit is that, and I think all of us in the sustainability profession might be guilty of this, is, and I definitely am. I mean, I would hate to listen to a recording of what I've just described to you. We use complex terms. We, you know, we use a lot of jargon and, um, you know, I think simplification is important just because something is complicated, it doesn't need to be complex. And I think this whole area of systems change can be very, very complicated. Um, so I think that's why a lot of this practice has taken a while to kind of emerge into the business lexicon. But if there's one thing that any business can do, I would say understand 
where you can have the biggest positive impact. So where are those material impacts that you have on environment and society? They probably, if you're a retailer, they won't be your logistics function. They won't even be plastic carrier bags. It will be where and how will you grow food? So really understand those material impact areas. And then going back to a concept that Jeffrey, you and I have talked about a lot, how can I create a net positive impact? So where I have these big impacts, how can I put more back into environment, more back into society than I take out? Because the stocks of capital of nature of society are really, really low at the moment. So any business to be really clear, where are those biggest impacts? You know, looking down your supply chain, usually your scope three carbon emissions, not your scope one. Understanding. Explain that. Three, three. For yes. Those who don't so, know the difference between scope one and scope three. So scope one carbon emissions, your direct carbon emissions, um, usually relatively small unless you're in oil and gas, in which case they're massive. Um, but if you're in retail, relatively small compared to your scope three carbon emissions, which are the emissions through your supply chain. And so, you know, you often hear a narrative which is, um, you know, we must fly less. Well, in fact, no one's flying anywhere at the moment. But anyway, um, aviation emission, aviation contributions to the global carbon budget is actually quite low compared with the production of food, compared with the production of apparel textiles. So understanding what's happening in your supply chain is often where you have the biggest impact. And so being really clear about that. So really paying attention, not just to your direct emissions, and it goes back to that graphic um, around your sphere of, sphere of control versus sphere of influence. Sometimes the best thing that the business can do is actually, instead of the investing a dollar in an incremental carbon reduction scheme in one manufacturing site, is investing that same dollar through the supply chain and you might actually get a really transformative impact on carbon reduction because the scale of the emissions are so much higher. Yeah. As we know from the research that we've done at Seventh Generation, 90% of our impact comes through consumer use of our product. And that's a scary thing to think that for many years we were focusing on only 10% of the problem yeah. rather than thinking about the impact our consumers have when they use our products. Uh, another question, you're, 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 you're generating some challenging questions here. Uh, when we think about certain industries like the coal industry or the fossil fuel industry, uh, there's a significant issue around stranded assets. Yeah. Um, money that is, is, is probably on the balance sheet of many companies that won't be able to actually be utilized if we're going to have a planet to, to live on. What do, we, what do we do? How do we think about that challenge of stranded assets and the transition we need to make yeah. to, to deal with them? Number one, let's not have any more. Um, so let's think about this properly and avoid creating them. We're still creating them. We're still building manufacturing facilities in parts of the world that we know are going to be subject to climate change. Why are we doing that? So let's just stop building stranded assets in the first instance. Where they do exist, and I think this concept of just transition is really, really important. Uh, we're doing quite a bit of work in the UK and in Asia looking at as we shift from a, a carbon economy, a fossil fuel based economy to a renewable economy, how do we make that work from a societal point of view? So it's all very well closing down a coal-fired power station in the Midlands in the UK, but what's going to happen to those jobs? And so we absolutely need to take an integrated approach to these societal and environmental issues and make a just transition a reality. And that means for a business that is thinking about its energy sourcing, when it's making that switch, taking the time to understand, well, what, what's going to happen to that community? Um, and I think, to be honest, one of that second dynamic area, I talked about the energy finance nexus. The reason we picked that out in the first system, which is why we need to, I think, build a much broader base for the economy. And B, as we think about energy transition pathways, food transition pathways, we can be better able to put in the societal considerations alongside the economic ones, alongside the environmental 
ones. And it goes back, I think, to building more flexibility into our economy. And in fact, I said a moment ago, um, you know, if nature was a bank, it would have been bailed out a long time ago. I actually think there's a flaw in that argument because if we just bail out nature using the current economic instruments that we have, we haven't actually changed the structure of nature. And so we have a debt fueled economy, it's built on debt. And actually what we have to do is to change the very functioning of the economy. So as we're re rebuilding natural assets, how do we change the flows, the structures of nature and not just pile in more debt of the same variety that we've had before? All right, here's a question I know you'll be happy to answer. What is Forum doing in the US? We are doing a number of different things. So um, we have a number of multi-stakeholder collaborations looking at um, increasing access to protein. Um, we had a really brilliant experiment um, looking at switching diets in school lunches as a way of um, accelerating plant-based proteins to market. That has been on a bit of a hiatus over the last few months as the schools have been shut. Um, but we, in a, we have a number of sectoral-based collaborations focusing on um, access to sustainable protein, access to cotton and so forth. So a number of multi-sector collaborations um, focusing on difficult issues. And then we have a number of partnerships with leading organizations, um, including Target. We've worked with Target for many, many years now. And that is our um, way of trying to accelerate transformation in business. I mean, what we're trying to do in the US is to play a role in ens ensuring that the food system, the energy system is more resilient. And we're doing that through our collaborations, but we're also doing it by working individually with organizations, but not just business. We work with folk like Food Corps, helping them understand their role in the system and drive systemic change. So we're trying in a nutshell to bring this practice of systems change and bring all our futures tools and techniques to bear in the US and we've got lots of ideas coming out of this COVID crisis like um, we have a project in our minds our American futures how do we use this major moment of dislocation to rebuild community resilience using future tools and techniques and to build back better great uh, have time for a couple of more well actually this is the last question uh, so the last question would be if we think about Africa and we think about systems change in Africa versus the traditional overexploitation of natural resources, what does that look like? Where, where would that take you? It would take you straight to an agricultural system based upon regenerative practices. Um, so we would have leapfrogged the bits in the middle that we've been through in the US and in Europe where we've had an agricultural system, the goals of which have been efficient food produced at the lowest cost possible. We have an opportunity in, Af in Africa to actually build a food system that's based upon regenerative principles. And it's already beginning to happen at a small scale. So in other words, we can, conceptualize and um, enable the emergence, oh, this is all of us collectively, right, um, of an economy in places like Africa that just leapfrogs the systems that we've created here in the US and Europe that aren't particularly sustainable, aren't particularly resilient. And I think reimagining therefore the very purpose of the food system, the purpose of the health system, the purpose of the economic system the sooner we do that in different parts of the world, the better able we will be able to build resilient systems that work for everybody, that are just and fair and equitable. Fantastic. This has been an amazing hour. We could go on and on and on. There's lots of questions that you've unearthed. I'd really encourage people to go to the forum website, sign up for your incredible newsletter to keep track of what is happening at the forum. And of course, uh, if you've got a project, if you've got a project that Sally could help you tackle, reach out to, to her. And uh, I know the forum has the capacity to deal with some really challenging problems. So please reach out to Sally in the forum. 
and uh, we're happy that all of you joined us. Uh, ASBC does a number of these webinars and they're one of the benefits that we offer, but if you're not a member, uh, please uh, reach out and uh, we'll tell you about membership. So Sally, thank you so much. This has been an amazing hour and uh, look forward to the work that you'll be doing in the future. Thank you and thanks for the invitation. It's been great to be able to have this conversation and I'm awesome. sure our, my US colleagues would be really happy to continue. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. All Thank right. You. Have a good day, everybody. Stay Bye. Safe.